The co-chairs Benata, Georgia Raidu, and Stefan Elziafra would like to welcome you to the award ceremony of the Dirk Bartz Prize for Visual Computing in Medicine 2021. Next slide, please. The Bartz Prize is a biannual competition. It was initiated in 2003. And this year, we implemented two major changes. First of all, from this year on, it will be co-located with the Eurovis conference. It used to be with the Eurographics conference before. And we also decided to broaden its scope to include, to invite, and also encourage more contributions from the life sciences. The prize in general addresses researchers and developers who can demonstrate a particular benefit in a medical or in a life sciences application that has resulted from the use of their visual computing technology. Next slide, please. As in previous years, we were able to gather an excellent, outstanding international jury with scientists uh, with a strong expertise in medical visualization and biological visualization research industry, and also applications in the clinical domain. So this year, we would also like to remember one of our colleagues who passed away, uh, Michael Westenberg. He was highly appreciated in the biomedical visualization research community, and he was awarded his PhD degree from the University of Groningen. In 2008, he joined the visualization group of the Department of uh, uh, Eindhoven University of Technology, first as assistant professor, and from 2017, he was associate professor there. And his research was focused on visual analytics for biomedical research. And Michel was very active in the international biovis community and he was multiple times a VCBM uh, program committee member. He was a very enthusiastic teacher and he has uh, guided many master and PhD students and our thoughts are with his family. So the Dirk Bartz Prize for uh, uh, Visual Computing in Medicine uh, was uh, this year awarded to uh, three um, awardees. And these were chosen based on their practical utility and whether they are practically useful tools only. So um, what we are looking for is not academic solutions of isolated research questions. This would not suffice but we are looking more into systems and frameworks that can be practically uh, adopted in, in, in the clinical workflow. So we had 11 submissions. All of them were very high quality. Uh, our life was very difficult. Each one of them was reviewed by three reviewers, one primary and two secondaries. And we made sure that all conflicts were addressed properly. We had five shortlisted uh, papers, five shortlisted submissions with the highest marks. And uh, therefore we had to bring in some more people from the uh, program co committee to help us select the three best ones. And now we're going to uh, announce after we hear all the talks, uh, the winners. And uh, Stefan. Stefan, you're muted. And the first talk is about visual analysis of tissue images at cellular level by Antonis Somarakis and his team. Hello everyone, today I'm going to walk you through our work on the visual analysis of tissue images at cellular level. I'll start my presentation trying to explain why we care so much about cells. Already, from 1830s, experts understood that humans are nothing more than a well-tuned assembly of cells. Hence, they realized that in order to understand an illness, they should examine in depth the cellular microenvironment. They started doing this with the microscopes and tireless observation of cell cultures and biopsies resulting in remarkable discoveries, such as the discovery of penicillin. And if, for the discovery of penicillin and the fight against dangerous bacteria, a microscope and human observation was adequate, for the fight against cancer or Alzheimer's seems that is not. Hence, we need more information than those we can extract from a microscope. 
Hopefully, recent advances in the development of image modalities enable researchers to acquire, instead of a magnified version of the tissue image that microscope can provide, a stack of high-resolution images. Each image provides information for a specific property of the cell, such as genes, transcripts, or proteins. Like the data used from our clinical collaborators, as protein-derived data are ideal for the answering of immunological questions, which the studies of our collaborators were focused. More specifically, data derived from imaging mass cytometry, providing for each tissue sample information for more than 40 proteins, or vector modality, which enables the measurement of up to six proteins, but with much higher throughput. Both of them providing subcellular resolution, ideal for the exploration of the cellular microenvironment. But why cellular microenvironment is so important? As it can be seen from these high impact studies issued last year, microenvironment features are linked to clinical outcomes. However, the extraction of significant clinical biomarkers from raw data is not straightforward. Instead, it entails many and complicated steps. To facilitate their analysis, we create a pipeline covering the main challenges experts may face, from the pre-processing of the images via the exploration of tissue samples to the comparison of clinical distinct cohorts of samples, for the extraction, eventually, of useful clinical biomarkers. Even though our pipeline has been formulated for the analysis of proteomics data, in principle can support the analysis of data derived from any kind of special omics modality, given they offer cellular resolution. And now, let's see each step in more detail, starting from the pre-processing, which entails the normalization and segmentation of cellular images. We will first describe the normalization step, as described in the paper, semi-automated background removal limits loss of data and normalizes the images for downstream analysis of imaging mass cytometry data. The protein abundance range in imaging mass cytometry data differs among tissue samples from different participants, due to their different tissue handling protocols. Hence, the combination of data from multiple subjects in a clinical study requires data normalization. We achieve this by analyzing the pixel values, utilizing a semi-supervised workflow, assigning each pixel either a signal or background, and then calculating a cell value the relative amount of signal pixels belonging to each cell. Here we can see an embedding showing the similarities among the cells based on their protein expression signatures, coral coded according to the tissue sample they belong. We can identify several clusters consisting of a single color, indicating that differences between samples dominate the similarities between the same cell types in different samples. However, our semi-supervised workflow managed to eliminate this artifact. Moving forward to the cell segmentation step, as described in the paper, iron rolling is a prominent feature of activated microglia in Alzheimer's disease patients. To extract cellular information from per pixel measurements, the identification of cellular boundaries is needed. Such a process is trivial for the majority of cell types, but not for the microglia cells with the big branches, especially when they are captured from a 2D imaging modality as vector. As part of their branches is cut during the tissue handling, resulting in images where microglia branches are detached and they are packed around pathogens, as illustrated here. To that end, to identify the main soma of the cell, we first use level set segmentation, then we separate those cells that are packed around the pathogen using watershed algorithm, and finally, we assign to each cell all the branches that are detached and exist in a close radius from the cell. Utilizing the workflow, we managed to identify with decent accuracy the microglia cells of 3,626 images from an Alzheimer study. Having pre-processed our data, we move forward to explore the cellular microenvironment with Imasite, as it is described in detail in the paper Imasite, Visual Exploration of Cellular Microenvironments for Imaging Mass Cytometry Data. Imasite offers an interactive workflow which is divided in three parts and start with the inspection of samples quality. For the discovery of possible batch effects, the user inspects the spatial patterns for many samples of a protein with a known pattern and the tissue samples are displayed in a small multiple view. The faulty samples, such as those highlighted here, are adjusted in other tools or excluded from further analysis. The workflow continues with identification of the cell types existing in the tissue samples. The type of a cell is defined according to the protein it expresses. Each image dimension expresses a protein. Hence, we have a high dimensional signature for each cell. Following our work on Cytosplore, we embed this high dimensional space into dimensions, where the user can visually discern cells with similar signatures and capture them into distinct cell types. Then the user can visually inspect the aggregate protein expression values of each cell type via a heat map view. 
In addition to our previous work, we use the semantic color coding for the clusters according to their similarities in the high dimensional space, which also aid the user to identify spatial patterns in the tissue view. All views are linked, enabling the user to interactively validate the results or amend them if necessary. Having identified the existing cell types, we start exploring in detail the spatial patterns. On average, each study has almost 30 different cell types, and each cell has five neighbors, forming this microenvironment. Hence, we first illustrate an overview of how frequently two cell types interact, and then we provide further details. For the overview, we utilize a heat map, where each column represents the cell type of interest, and each row the cell types existing in the microenvironment. On top of the heat map, we place a bar graph, showing the abundance of each cell type. The darker a box of the heat map is, it represents cell types that interact more frequently. While this overview provides a general idea of tissue functionality, it's not adequate to answer more complex questions, such as which other types exist in the microenvironment of red cells when green cells are present? Do all the cell types have homogeneous behavior? In order to answer such questions, we mapped all the distinct microenvironments using the concept of motifs, where motifs are a group of cells of the same cell type that have in the microenvironment the same cell types. To visualize these motifs, we designed a simple glyph inspired by the actual spatial composition. The amount of motifs in each study can vary from hundreds to thousands. To facilitate their exploration, we display the corresponding glyphs in a small multiple view and link it to the interactions overview to filter them according to their properties. Using Imasite, our collaborators analyzed eight different cancer tissue sums with more than 20,000 cells and identified 20 distinct cell types, and more specifically, a special pattern among an immune cell type and cancer cells, which is possibly linked to the proliferation of cancer cells. In the previous step, we focused on the analysis and exploration of cell types and cellular microenvironment individual sums. Now, we will describe how we will enable the user to identify whether these characteristics are correlated with a specific clinical condition, as it is explained in the paper Visual Cohort Comparison for Spatial Single Cell Omics Data. In our interactive visual system, SpaceCo, the user can compare the cohorts and identify possible outliers based on the amount of cellular types or the special patterns they form, and at the same time, link any finding to its special position to place it to the general comparison context. Let's examine now the individual parts of our system in detail. The main difference among two cohorts is usually expressed with a variation in their cell types. To explore these differences, we utilized two parameterized versions of rain cloud plots, one for each cohort, assigning to them two complementary colors, blue and orange, and then we superpose them. The plot illustrates both the abundance of the cell type in its tissue sample and the overall distribution of the cohort. To enable a comparison for all cell types, we use a small multiples approach, illustrating all cell types in a list, allowing the user to identify the cell types that differentiate the cohort the most, filtering them or aggregating them. Also, the user clicking on a line can locate the cell types in their exact special position. In case though that cohorts with distinct clinical characteristics have similar cellular abundances, a more detailed comparison based on the microenvironment is needed. As we explained during the exploration step of our pipeline, an exhaustive comparison of the cohorts based on all the different cell type combinations would be impossible. To that end, we first provide an overview, calculating for each cohort how often two cell types interact. And then we subtract their values based on a user-defined method, illustrating the explicit coding in a heat map, where again, the columns represent the cell type of interest and the rows the cell type that exists in the microenvironment. For a heat map, we utilized a divergent color map based on the previously described complementary colors. Having an overview of the special interactions, additional questions again arise. Do all microenvironment of more than two cell types further differentiate the cohort? Do all sums in a cohort have the same abundance? To facilitate the answer of these questions, we allow the user to select any combination of cell types and explore their co-occurrence in each sample through an interactive visual query system. To illustrate the abundance of the cells in each sample that fulfill the select combination, we we'll utilize the same visual representations as we described before, where blue and orange distributions represent the abundance of the select combination in each cohort. Our collaborators used SpaceCo for a study on Alzheimer, 
identify the positive correlation among the spatial proximity of amyloid plaques and iron-loaded microglia cells in Alzheimer patients. Findings which were also later statistically verified. In this project, we present a complete pipeline for the analysis of spatial omics data, spanning from the segmentation of complex cellular structures and image preprocessing, over the exploration of cellular microenvironments, to the detailed comparison of clinically distinct cohorts of samples, which ended up, besides the scientific output, to two open source tools, Imasite and Spaceco, which are already a vital part of our collaborators in LUMC and start gaining ground worldwide. Finally, I would like to thank my collaborators from Leiden University Medical Center and TU Delft. Yeah. Uh, Antonios, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic talk and uh, congratulations on this great work. Um, so the idea is that we are shown questions that have been collected via YouTube chat and uh, Discord chat. And uh, until now, I don't see any questions. So maybe I can I can start with, with one. I liked the, the glyph design um, that you presented, these motif glyphs. And um, I was wondering, did you come up with this particular design in the first place, or did you go through a design, through multiple design iterations, and also where the your your application scientists were they really able to decode um, the glyphs, or did they need some some training? Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, um, yeah, actually, there was a. Um, we inspired the design of this glyph uh, based on the circular micro the, the cellular microenvironment actually. So that was the first uh, initiation of the design. And also, uh, our focus was mostly to provide um, a qualitative uh, met a qualitative glyph that can help uh, the the experts to identify this distinct uh, biologically significant, let's say, uh, microenvironment. So we started also and we experimented with other uh, other types of design, uh, more straightforward. Uh, but actually, uh, we found out that uh, this was uh, uh, this uh, this glyph could uh, better serve our purpose. But on the other hand, this, as we have as you have seen, it is not really straightforward as design. So actually, yes, it uh, it needed some uh, some time from for, from the experts in order to. To fully understand it and, and, and use it and actually uh, integrate in their pipeline. But uh, as soon as they, they learn it, I think uh, now it's pretty common also. It, and also, has even started to, to show up in some uh, works and publications. So I think um, mm -hmm. at the end, uh, they get to learn. Yeah. It. Great. Thanks. So, so I, I have a Follow-up question: you, you mentioned that there are, or that there can be, hundreds to thousands of these motifs. So, um, yeah. is it correct that there are then also two phases of glyph decoding? That in the first phase, maybe you get an overview of whether there are similar groups of motifs, and then in the second phase, you start to look at individual glyphs and try to decode them. Exactly. So the case is. Uh, so we first uh, saw this kind of, of glyphs that we have seen, and then um, there is, if you have noticed, there is a white part which uh, shows the variation of, of these uh, of these motifs in the in the tissue. Mm -hmm. So it shows similar motifs, but not not identical motifs. So in the second phase, uh, we saw the exact, um, actually all the different distinct microenvironments that exist. Um, so yeah, it. it it works more or less like um, in an uh, overview first uh, detail on demand uh, uh, approach uh, in order also to map all these uh, all these motifs. But even in the overview motifs are, are maybe could be uh, hundreds or even thousands or, or even thousands. That's why we have also linked it with the first part, which shows the uh, one to one uh, cell type interactions in order also to further uh, facilitate the user to explore them mm -hmm. and filter them. Okay, thanks. 
for that time. Just, yeah, I would like question. to ask something <laughs> also. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay. So thank you very much for the nice talk also from my side. And uh, I was wondering if you wanted to pick one thing that would be, let's say, the most uh, challenging or the most, uh, um, uh, I don't know, troublesome, like throughout this whole work, what would you pick? I think um, the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I could, uh, I could say that they also, yeah, the first work was the most uh, uh, difficult uh, and also because also that was the, part, the first, the, the beginning of, of my PhD. So it was also some other, uh, it was really, yeah, inspiring and also difficult for me to, to deal. But, uh, and, and then uh, as, as you know better than me, uh, at the end, if you start the project, then more projects arise really <laughs> on the go and on the flow. So I think the beginning was the most uh, difficult, let's say. So yeah, the EMA site uh, work as you, as uh, I described. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, also. So um, I, I guess we can move on or we have more questions, I don't know. No, I don't see more questions from the audience popping up. So I would use this opportunity to encourage the audience actually to ask questions via the YouTube chat or the Discord channel. You can do this also afterwards, I guess. So Antonios will, you can contact him as well, I assume. Of course. For further questions. Of course, of course. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. So yeah, then we can actually move on with the second award presentation. Okay. Okay, so we can move on to the next topic, which is uh, visual assistance in clinical decision support. And the talk will be given by Juliane Müller. Please, Juliane. The common process and therapy decision-making for cancer patients at our collaborating tumor centers in Leipzig and Magdeburg, Germany, starts with consultations and examinations followed by the tumor board preparation as well as the tumor board implementation. The tumor board is a multidisciplinary discussion with experts from different domains and is required for each cancer patient treatment decision making. Within the tumor boards at our collaborating university hospitals, a patient case is introduced by the attending physician and the patient specific image data is um, displayed via a projector. In a short debate, mainly three to four minutes, the domain experts discuss the case and agree on a treatment recommendation. In case the available patient information is insufficient for a sound decision, an additional examination may be required by repeating consultations, examinations, and the tumor board preparation. If the patient agrees on a recommended therapy option, the treatment is initiated. Otherwise, the case might be discussed again in the tumor board. To identify recurrences and poor functional outcomes at an early stage, patient-centric aftercare is applied. Within this procedure, there are general challenges hampering decision-making, such as the high amount of treatment options, the uncertainty about the effectiveness of an option, and the frequent missing values. Furthermore, there are challenges within each individual step. To address these challenges, we developed six visual approaches assisting in tumor board preparation and tumor board implementation, in aftercare, and in building therapy models. Our proposed therapy models are based on Bayesian networks, since they are especially suited for reasoning under uncertainty and missing values. Briefly explained, Bayesian networks are probabilistic directed acyclic graphical models that represent probabilistic relations. So for example, an effect represented by the node laryngeal cancer is dependent on the causes of tobacco and alcohol abuse. 
A conditional probability table per node is constituting its if-then relations and the parent nodes, where each node takes on a probability distribution. During the tumor bud preparation, the attending physician has to face multiple challenges. So for example, she has to search for and summarize all examination results and findings in the hospital information system and in paper-based records. Based on the key findings, she has to make a treatment recommendation and be able to justify the treatment. In this context, she has to know the clinical guidelines. And additionally, she has to be able to name other possible treatment recommendations and their suitability, as well as as she has to be able to compare recommendations after changing patient-specific information due to new examination results, for example. We have addressed these challenges in two visual approaches. In the first approach, we developed an interactive graph view for the structured verification of a computed recommendation. We demonstrated our tool in the, on the TNM staging in laryngeal cancer management. The TNM staging describes the tumor size and type, the lymph node infiltration, and the distant metastasis spreading, and is based on clinical guidelines. We developed the related Bayesian network in close collaboration with a medical researcher over multiple years. Our approach includes tailor-made glyphs for encoding the probability distributions, interaction techniques for Bayesian network graph exploration, and comparative visualizations of two TNMs resulting from two sets of patient-specific information entities. In an evaluation study outside the tumor board with five experienced clinicians, we identified that the unstructured and unordered presentation of nodes using a force-directed layout hampers in computed recommendation verification and is not applicable within clinical routine. Therefore, we developed a new visual approach to explainable clinical decision support. Inspired by decision-making within clinical routine, our improved and award-winning approach consists of four parts. The evidence view um, represents all available patient-specific information in a structured manner regarding their relevance of influence on the computed recommendation. The guidelines view shows um, the related clinical guidelines and doctor's letters. The outcome view presents target nodes such as the node for treatment recommendation and other computed recommendations. And last but not least, the network view allows for a structured exploration along the causal flow of the underlying Bayesian network. In an evaluation study with uh, six experienced otolaryngologists using the Bayesian network for TNM staging of laryngeal cancer patients again and outside the tumor board, we assess the usability, medical relevance, and applicability um, within healthcare as very important and useful. Before application within clinical routine, however, our approach must be fully integrated and evaluated within the tumor board. Based on our approach, the Radboud University in the Netherlands, in collaboration with us, submitted a grant proposal for the development and implementation of Bayesian networks as clinical decision support systems within clinical routine uh, for patients suffering from endometrial cancer. The main challenges for physicians during tumor board implementation are in the semi-structured presentation of patient-specific information entities on paper-based case sheets and in the oral case introduction. Furthermore, they sometimes have to participate in the discussion without a physical consultation beforehand. To identify which information entities are crucial in order to make a valid treatment decision, we developed a questionnaire and asked eight medical experts from different domains. We identified three main content groups for the head and neck cancer tumor board dashboards, which are the patient metrics, the therapy metrics, and disease metrics, and present them in a map of information. Based on the map of information for head and neck cancer patients, we expanded our focus area to the dermatological tumor board. 
we again identified three main content groups, which are the general patient data, the prognostic parameters, and the therapy data. Five experienced dermatologists assessed our approach as applicable within the dermatological tumor board. Especially for head and neck cancer patients, the disease and the treatment are mostly accompanied with a wide variety of related functional impairments, such as swallowing, voice pain, etc., which have a huge impact on the patient's daily life and their perceived quality of life. To assess and react on these problems at an early stage, um, supplementation of aftercare consultations with patient-reported outcome measurements is recommended to ensure a patient-centered aftercare. Patient-reported outcomes are any reports recorded directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician. We have developed an interactive visual approach visualizing the progress of the patient's condition over time and um, uh, presenting the conditions in comparison to the whole cohort in order to predict the patient's future outcome based on the investigation of similar patients. Our prototype is currently being integrated in the commercial software called OncoFunction for clinical routine use at the Department of Otorhinolaryngology at the University Hospital in Leipzig, Germany. The data recorded within clinical decision making allows for new opportunities in building therapy models. This data, however, is characterized by high frequent missing values, mixed data types, and many attribute, attributes, but less observations. Since correlations are indicators for possible causal connections, correlation analysis assists in building therapy models and hypothesis generation. For this, we developed an improved version of the do analysis approach, allowing for the joint simultaneous analysis of quantitative and qualitative data, which wasn't really able before. In summary, we presented the decision-making workflow of cancer treatment within clinical routine and described several visual assistance solutions addressing the associated needs of physicians at multiple steps of this workflow. By using familiar presentations and focusing on the interaction design, we decrease the required learning effort and improve the acceptability for all applications. In future work, we want to investigate the requirements on visualizations and interactions which, which would allow patients during clinician consultation to better understand the treatment recommendation of the tumor board. In this context, we have to identify the key information, letting patients trust in the treatment recommendation, as well as design abstracted visualizations and simple interactions usable for the patients. In the end, we want to thank the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research and the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt for their support. Thank you very much, Liliane, for the nice talk and the wonderful work. So while we are waiting for people to get a bit less shy and uh, uh, pop their questions, maybe for the sake of time, I can ask a, a question which I'm burning to know the answer for. So as you correctly said at the beginning of your talk, a tumor board consists of many different specialists. So how do you manage to work uh, uh, successfully with all of them uh, and uh, to be able to support also the different specializations with their different needs and also potentially to, to bridge them? Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice words, Renata. And um, yeah, it's like we, uh, we had uh, some really good collaborators in, in Leipzig from the head and neck department and they knew many physicians so and they uh, like um, contacted us with uh, the other physicians from the different disciplines and then we were able to ask them and um, yeah we connected to them and then we uh, prepared a questionnaire especially for the head and neck cancer tumor board like for the dashboard for this one project 
And um, yeah, we uh, um, asked the different physicians like the same questions. And then with this, we, uh, we found a solution which was like good for all of the different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Were there any particular challenges like in, in managing to, let's say, to compromise between what different people wanted actually? Uh, yeah, of course, like different people have different things in mind, especially people from the pathology or from the radiology. They are interested in different things than, for example, um, people from the head and neck surgery department. But um, in the end, we were able to find like a good solution and, and identified, okay, which, which information were like important for all of them and which are not so important. And uh, then we developed this map of information where we identified, okay, which, are, which should be visualized all the time and which should be visualized just on um, like if the people are asking for it. Mm -hmm. on attention. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I don't see any questions yet, so maybe I can go on with my, my own. <laughs> um, <laughs> in, in all cases, you um, have uh, designed and developed uh, highly interactive tools, which uh, I suppose they require quite some time for the exploration and the, and the analysis and the decision making as well. So given the limited amount of time that um, uh, doctors and uh, uh, all the uh, specialists that participate in tumor boards, um, they have very little time to assess one case. How time efficient would you say that is your approach? Yeah, what we always try to do is to identify the most important information and visualize them all at once. And the user is just required to, to interact with our tools if he or she wants to see further information. So for mm -hmm. example, for the visual approach to explainable clinical decision support, we visualize the, the patient-specific information entities, the guidelines and the, the, um, the target nodes um, on one view, and the network view is just visualized on demand when you scroll down. because we identified that the um, users were not so interested in the network view, but mostly in the, in the patient specific information and what the model thinks is the best recommendation, for example, the best therapy for this particular patient. And also to integrate um, new patient specific information, you have to do, like you have to interact with our tool, but um, apart from that, you can see it all at once. And that was our main goal, like to, to have the main information at once and then just um, interact with it on demand. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I see that we actually have a question here from uh, Jern Kolhammer. Uh, do you also see visualizations being adapted for use by resident doctors, not only clinics who have a better overview of medical guidelines in decision-making? Oh, like, um, I hope that resident doctors will use our approaches, but we haven't spoken to resident doctors yet. So we were just uh, collaborating with um, university hospitals since they are also like focusing on research. And um, yeah, but that's a, it's a good recommend or good hint like to maybe think about like resident doctors and, and bring our tools to them and ask what they think, like, is it really useful for them or do they have other requirements also? Okay, thank you very much. So um, for the sake of time, I would uh, suggest that uh, more questions can be asked also on Discord or on Topia. So thank you very much again, Juliane, and we can slowly move on to the next talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So the next talk we are going to hear is given by Benjamin Behrendt. And Benjamin is going to present the work of uh, himself and his team. And uh, they work together on the visual exploration of intracranial aneurysm blood flow adapted to clinical researchers. Hello, 
and welcome to my talk about the visual exploration of intracranial aneurysm blood flow adapted to the clinical researcher. If we ask ourselves the question, why would visual exploration of aneurysm blood flow be useful, we can find an answer from basically two different perspectives. From a research perspective, of course it is interesting to understand the interaction of blood flow and the vessel wall. So how do changes in the vessel wall affect the underlying blood flow? And how does uh, the blood flow in turn affect the vessel wall? From a clinical perspective, the ultimate goal is of course to assess the rupture risk for aneurysms and to predict the effects of treatment. Uh, the rupture of an aneurysm uh, is often fatal for the patient, but of course the treatment itself also bears risks. So for the clinician, it is interesting to compare the risk of rupture and the risk of the treatment to make an optimal treatment decision for the patient. If we visualize blood flow within aneurysms, we often have general visualization problems, uh, mainly that we are dealing with complex flow patterns with nested structures, for example vortices, which are hidden uh, in more laminar flow. Uh, we also have a complex vessel anatomy, possibly with multiple regions of interests, and we have both parameters on the vessel wall and on the flow itself that are important. So for example, we have wall shear stress or uh, pressure on the vessel wall and velocity or curvature uh, on the path lines themselves. When collaborating with our clinicians, we often encounter the question, what type of flow structure is associated with a certain surface feature? So for example, increased wall shear stress or pressure. So we developed an application to answer this question, which consists of three steps. First, we need a comprehensive visualization of surface features. Then the user must be able to interactively select these features. And uh, last but not least, of course, visualize the flow that is associated with the selected feature. Starting with the first uh, option, our interactive feature selection looks like this. It's an opaque visualization of the vessel wall with parameters such as wall shear stress or pressure mapped to the wall using a discrete color scale. And in order to select such a feature, the user simply has to click on it, as you can see in this demonstration. So we are basically performing a flat fill on the vessel surface in order to be able to select features. Of course, it is possible to switch the parameter that is displayed on the fly and it is also possible to manually select regions if the user desires. After the uh, interesting regions on the vessel surface are selected, we switch to a more transparent visualization. The surface selection is still visible as you can see and then for each of these selections the user can individually display the associated flow, for example like this. We are basically filtering pre-existing path lines based on a distance measure to the selected surface region. The resulting path lines are color coded uh, and it is possible to display multiple of these line bundles uh, at the same time. As you can see here, with our selection of surface features, we managed to find three very different flow structures in our data set. Now, of course, there's a problem with this approach uh, as we are dealing with pre-integrated path lines. Features that are poorly represented in this unfiltered set, uh, of course, cannot be extracted. Uh, so if there's something missing from the complete set, it will, of course, also be missing from the filtered set. An example for this uh, is seen here. In elongated aneurysms, there often are stagnant zones with very little blood flow you can see it at the top of this aneurysm uh, and it is very hard to get uh, path lines to go into this area, of course, because there's very little flow going in this region at all. So our solution to this problem was to generate new path lines dynamically that fulfill specified criteria using evolutionary algorithms. The task of generating path lines can be formulated as an optimization problem for evolutionary algorithms. All we need is a quality criterion that evaluates the path lines 
uh, and allows us to decide if one path line is better than another path line. And we need a suitable representation of path lines for the evolutionary algorithm. Let me give you quickly a bit of background on evolutionary algorithms. Uh, they are based on the principle of natural selection by Charles Darwin. The goal is to find elements in a set that optimize a fitness function by means of iterative improvement of random candidates using evolutionary motivated mechanisms. These are crossover, combining two elements to form a new element, mutation, which is changing an existing element, and lead selection, as the name suggests, is just selecting a good element. Uh, how do we apply evolutionary algorithms to pathline seedings? Well, we interpret a pathline as a single seed point, so this is our individual, a single seed point on the inflow plane, which uniquely defines its associated pathline, of course. Our fitness function is a user-defined function. I will talk about this in a second. And the evaluation of the fitness function requires the full integration of the pathline from its seed point. For mutation, we are basically adding a weighted displacement vector to the seed point, so we're moving it around on the inflow plane a little bit, and the crossover is currently not used in our prototype. As I've mentioned, the fitness function is user-defined, so the user can build his own or her own fitness function uh, based on some predefined parameters, which are then evaluated per vertex of the path line. Uh, we have multiple parameters available. They can be line-based, so for example, the length of a line, its curvature, velocity at a specific point, or distance to the vessel wall. They can also be surface-based, so in this case we are looking for the surface regions that a path line passes at a specific point. So here we can use pressure or wall shear stress. It is optionally possible to limit the parameter evaluation to the aneurysm area in order to prevent other regions of the vessel, which may not be interesting, to contribute to the fitness of a line. And these parameters can be freely weighted and combined to form a final fitness function. And then from these per vertex fitness values, a final fitness for the entire line is calculated using either the sum, max or average of the per vertex values. Let's look at some results. Uh, what we see here are fitness maps, where we map the uh, fitness of lines to the uh, seating plane. Uh, white areas produce low quality lines and red areas produce high quality lines. Quality, of course, in the sense that they have a high fitness. We have two cases here. Uh, in both cases, we have randomly seeded lines or seeded lines at random positions. Uh, in the first example, we seeded uh, just about 8,000 lines, and in the second example, a million lines. And of course, the fitness map in the case for the million lines is much more deta detailed, as one would expect. Uh, but of course, seeding a million lines in practice is not feasible. So uh, if we use our evolutionary algorithm, we still only seeded 8,000 lines in total, so these are the total amounts of line integrations performed by the algorithm. And we can see that the uh, level of detail in the regions with high fitness is almost identical to the other case, uh, where we seeded a million lines. But of course, in total, we have seeded much less than that with our evolutionary algorithm and reached an almost comparable fitness. If you look at the path lines directly, you can also see a difference quite easily. In the first example, we used uniform seeding and seeded 1,000 lines in total, then performed a filtering to find lines that uh, come close to this selected surface area here. And after filtering, only 23 lines remained. Uh, then we did the same with the evolutionary algorithm. We seeded 460 lines in total, uh, with a fitness function that optimizes for lines close to this specific area. Then we performed the same filtering and got uh, 47 lines after filtering. So 
with on with less than half of the total amount of line integrations, we got more than double the amount of usable lines uh, in this case. And last but not least, let's go back to our first example, the stagnant zones. Once again, with uniform seeding, we don't get uh, good path line coverage, but uh, by applying a evolutionary algorithm, it is possible to get path lines to fill the entire aneurysm, including the stagnant zone. So to conclude my talk, I have presented methods of extracting flow features or structures based on surface features in cerebral aneurysms, both by filtering a set of existing path lines and generating new path lines using evolutionary algorithms. Of course, the work in this area is not completed yet. Uh, there are still lots of things to do. For example, we would need better support for longitudinal studies. Right now, the uh, prototype is optimized to viewing single data sets, but if we have multiple data sets from the same patient, of course, uh, it would be interesting to develop tools to directly compare these data sets and see how the aneurysm has developed over time and the flow. It would also be desirable to support the visualization of wall movement. Uh, in our example, we assume the vessel wall to be rigid, which of course is not true in reality. Uh, and it would also be interesting to visualize uh, this. And last but not least, uh, specific for the evolutionary algorithm, it would also be interesting to take a look at the parameter space of the evolutionary algorithm, to explore the parameter space, find settings for the evolutionary algorithm, uh, which may even produce better results than the ones that we have currently used. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm open to any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for this great talk. Fascinating work you have done. Work that I, of course, know also quite uh, quite well from, thank you. from the past. Um, so I'm also trying to bridge, I guess, the time a bit until questions are arriving from the um, from the audience. Um, ben, I was wondering how much of your work do you think can be actually translated to other application areas and how much is specific to the aneurysm domain? I think uh, actually quite a lot can be transferred uh, because if you go down to it, uh, basically what we've implemented is a, a filtering approach for path lines based on surfaces. So there's no real need for this to be uh, strictly aneurysms or even blood flow data. So if you have other uh, situations where you have some sort of flow, maybe airflow uh, in combination with a surface, uh, this whole set can be very easily uh, applied to that as well. The same, of course, goes for the evolutionary algorithm, uh, as long as there's uh, some way to encode uh, these, these path lines, um, this should work very easily. In our case, we encoded the path lines as seed points uh, on the inflow plane of the vessel. Of course, uh, if you have a different application, uh, maybe this definition uh, is not applicable, then uh, this has to be changed. But the principle of the system could be applied to basically anything where you have a combination of some sort of flow and some sort of surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I would also have a, a second question, if, if, if you don't mind, Renata. And... Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering, do you expect to see in the near future physicians uh, in clinical routine using the visualizations that you just presented? Or do you rather think that they are uh, one building block on the way to some risk scores or something like this that will be presented then to the physicians one day? Um, well, my, my work is, is primarily oriented towards the researchers. So I don't see really a physician who maybe has a patient and is, is uh, doing treatment decisions based on my tools. Uh, basically, my, my tool set is designed for, for knowledge generation to better understand the blood flow or the development of aneurysms. Uh, and once we do that, once we have a better model of, of uh, how, for example, the flow actually impacts the uh, change of rupture or 
how, once we can better predict how an aneurysm will develop over time, this will then, of course, lead to better treatment decisions. But I don't think that at any point in this whole process, an actual uh, physician treating a patient will be directly using uh, my tools. They will probably use the knowledge, uh, hopefully, that is generated uh, from tools just like mine. Hmm. So I see that there's one question from uh, the audience. And the question is, what is the parameter space of the evolutionary algorithm that could be explored further in future? Um, right now, the parameter space is basically the position of the path line uh, in the, uh, on the inflow plane. This is basically what the, the um, evolutionary algorithm optimizes. Uh, and for the evolutionary, evolutionary algorithm itself, um, we have, of course, the uh, number of iterations because uh, the evolutionary algorithm can run basically as long as you want. You can just keep generating uh, new new generations of path lines, which will hopefully be better than the previous generation. Um, so there you can either set a stopping criterion. For example, I want to stop if the average fitness of my path lines reaches this value, or you can just say I want to iterate 100 times or 1,000 times etc. Uh, and then, of course, the fitness function itself, depending on, on what type of path lines you want to have. Uh, so for example, if you just want to see vortices, it would be useful to optimize for high curvature and or long lines. And of course, since this is basically uh, like a Lego system where you put together different, uh, different uh, aspects of the fitness function, um, yeah, you'll have to see what produces exactly the type of lines or best produces the type of lines you want in the fastest time. And last but not least, um, the evolutionary algorithm also has settings uh, in relation to how much mutation and how much elite selection is done um, and how much, how much crossover is done. Crossover is not done at the moment uh, in our system, but of course, all this, these settings can be tweaked and uh, you'd have to basically explore the space to find an evolutionary algorithm setting which produces the best path lines in the fastest way, of course. Okay, great, thanks. I don't see further questions um, from the audience. So I guess that we can move on with the final reward ceremony. So I see that uh, all the awardees are extremely excited and uh, I will try not to delay too much their uh, stress. So we start with the third place. And the third place is an interactive data-driven pipeline covering the main analysis challenges that experts face from the pre-processing of images via the exploration of tissue samples until the comparison of cohorts of, of uh, samples. And all parts of this pipeline were developed in close collaboration with domain experts uh, from the uh, biological point of view and are already a vital part in their daily analysis routine. So by now, I think you might know already uh, that I'm talking about uh, the visual analysis of tissue images at cellular level from Antonis Somarakis. And congratulations, Antonis, and uh, uh, to also all of your colleagues. Um, here, the reviewers saw that the research project presented in this submission was an exemplary case of uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, which focused on very timely problems that actually require visual aid. Uh, also, this is a topic that we don't see very often in the visualization community. And uh, also uh, the strengths of this approach were emphasized by the fact that the partial outcomes were published at very high level venues. So congratulations, Antonis and colleagues. Yeah, congratulations also from my side. Very well deserved. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So this 
brings us to the second place. The second place is awarded to uh, a pipeline for supporting treatment decision-making in solid cancer diseases. And uh, the approach um, uh, can assist physicians in finding the optimal patient-specific treatment by visual assistance in the preparation and implementation of expert meetings discussing cancer cases and aftercare consultation. So this gives away that uh, the second place goes to visual assistance in clinical decision support by Juliane Mueller and her colleagues. And all reviewers found the work clinically re relevant, sorry, and very important, and praised the very visible teamwork and in-depth collaboration between these researchers and clinical domain experts. As mentioned by the reviewers, this is a clinically useful system which was developed and evaluated step-by-step step over many years in a large team of computer scientists and clinicians. It is impressive that an attempt was made to embed the solution in a clinical environment. So congratulations, Juliane and uh, colleagues. It's a very well-deserved uh, uh, work. So without further ado, we can go to the first place. Uh, yeah, and there's, there's actually not so much surprise left. <laughs> uh, it's probably pretty obvious now that the first place goes to um, work uh, where a visual exploration framework that supports a combination of visualization, filtering, and interaction techniques for the explorative analysis of blood flow with a focus on the relation of local surface parameters, as we have just seen in underlying flow structures. And this work shows clear benefits and uh, potential for patient-specific um, treatment plans. So as you all know by now, this the first place goes to Benjamin Behrendt and his team for their work on the visual exploration of intracranial aneurysm blood flow adapted to the clinical researcher. And here, the um, reviewers, all reviewers, appreciated that this is a strong and good submission with a relevant clinical target. The potential clinical relevance is seen positively by all reviewers, or was seen positively, and the submission was supported by publications in relevant dissemination venues. Altogether, it's uh, seen positive that new ideas from the visualization research come with the potential of positively influencing medical decision-making as well as treatment planning. And it was mentioned by the reviewers that the submission is strong by presenting a dedicated study with very specific diagnostic and treatment tasks involving actually three physicians and uh, five cases. This is something that Benjamin not talked about in his um, presentation. Um, it shows very clearly that the technique has changed the treatment plan for the benefit of the patient based on stronger in-depth um, understanding of the vascular flow. So congratulations very much to Benjamin and the uh, entire team for the first prize. Very well deserved, excellent work. Thank you very congratulations much. Congratulations also from my side. Thank you. Yeah, so there does not remain a lot uh, for Renata and me uh, to say, apart from that it was a lot of fun, even though these very good works made our lives uh, kind of complicated, at least for a certain time. But uh, we thank um, all the contributors to the to the prize, also the ones that were not awarded. Um, of course, also very excellent works were submitted there. We thank the audience for attending. And I would like to point you to the next Dirk Bartz Prize, which will be awarded at the Euros Conference in 2023. Um, and uh, please consider to submit there. As I said, we have broadened the scope, so we explicitly also invite uh, contributions from, from the life sciences. I think this will be reflected then also in an updated call for papers and maybe also in a slightly updated name of the prize. We don't, we don't know yet, but uh, this is left to uh, Renata and uh, her prospective uh, um, co-chairs. And yeah, so please consider to, to contribute there. And if you make your decision to contribute, most of the work has already been done because you 
had very fascinating projects in the past. You always you already published a lot. The only thing you need to do is to write a little summary uh, and and uh, yeah, sum everything up that you have done and, and submit it. So with this, I would like to thank you again for uh, attending and also thanks to the to the speakers and uh, thanks a lot to Renata and also to, to the technicians who supported us excellently in this session. Congratulations to everyone and yeah. thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.